shift to, to things cricket. Um, and let's, let's talk about the height of Kumar Sangakara. If I say that, what do you think? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's, uh, that's that's funny. Are you, are you not that guy? Are you are you not that guy who's worried about facts and figures? Uh no. I well, I, I remember my my. I remember the number of test hundreds I've got. Uh, I and that I've crossed ten thousand and up twelve thousand runs. I can't tell you exactly the final tally of runs. Uh, and I don't keep any mementos, so I have nothing at um, nothing at home. Well, from my cricketing days, given most of it away, um, <laughs> I have a couple of medals from the World Cups. Uh, that's about it, really. Okay, so, so not the bat that you scored three hundred with, not the you oh. know, nothing like that. None, none. I, have, I don't have a single bat at home that I've scored any runs with. I think uh, Shane Duff. Uh, who was an assistant coach, might have the bat and the pads that I wore to score. Uh, when I put on the partnership with Mahel at the 624, I think he's got some of the stuff. And I used to give most of my stuff away to, um, um, to uh, 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 a gentleman by the name of P.D. Nimal. He actually came into the Sri Lankan side uh, to help us with our luggage. Uh, he was, uh, he was a, a curator at the SSC grounds in Colombo. And then he went on. He had a really good throwing arm, so he would throw slip catchers. He would do throw downs to the team, and he was he was a part of the national side. And he used to always tell me that, you know, I came into the side with you, and the day you retire, I'm going to retire as well. And unfortunately, um, he he died um, a few years ago, crossing the road in front of his house. He got hit by a motorbike, um, oh, and then later passed away, which was a which was a tragedy. Uh, we were in England touring at the time, and if I remember, I was at Lords uh, playing a Test match in 2011-12 um, um, when that happened. Um, so it was it was quite uh, it was quite a sad day. So he had a, almost 80 percent of 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 my awards, medals, uh, and various other things that I got over the years. So I'm sure he's still with his family. Okay, well, I, there's so many quotes. I've, Spoken to a few of the guys um, over lockdown, and and the little things that you find out that you you don't know. I mean, you you can't know unless a guy talks about. It. But this is the sort of thing you wouldn't really talk about, right? Is there a reason you wouldn't keep any of your stuff? Ah, uh, well, yeah, I I kind of you know I I still work in in commentary, especially in England and during the IPL. Uh, in India, so that keeps me connected to cricket. Uh, my kids are also, uh, they don't play cricket. I have a, a girl and a boy, twins. Um, and also, I don't have a, I, it's, I, I don't know, it's never really interested me to have, have my, my, my memorabilia on display. Although I do have uh, Murali's, all of his record-breaking t-shirts, and I have I'm in the Vasa's 350th wicket T-shirt, so I have those, and they're they're kept away. But those are the only four things I have. I have nothing of mine, so it's yeah. I've never had them on display. I think my mother in Candy has a few few things that my wife's given her, so she might have some. I think my wife's kept some away. I don't know, yeah, in a cupboard somewhere maybe, but they're definitely not on display. So I don't know. It did. Um, it's just the case that, you know, the fact that I moved on from my playing days into a, you know, kind of a different season of my life. So, mm. uh, it, yeah, it, it, yeah I've, I've never had that kind of emotional attachment to, to that kind of, uh, yeah, keeping mementos around from my cricketing days. Well, it had, let me say that you hold so many records in, in terms of the game. Test match records, one day international records, and, and quite obviously you're highly regarded. But you also go a little bit under the radar. You know, and people don't you, you know you don't hear people singing Sangha's praises. Maybe in Sri Lanka, I'm not there, so I can't I can't know that. But but in general terms, would you have any idea why that would be? Not that you're after it, but you know, I mean. 
twelve and a half thousand runs, just about fourteen thousand and one days, eleven double hundreds. I mean, I could go on. I don't want to, but I could go on. So, do you have any idea why you might kind of be under the radar? Um, I I don't know. I mean, I think also the narrative around the world uh, depends on on what's in focus and who's in focus and which country is in focus. So, there are of course. You know, so many heavyweights from around the world that have played and and done amazing things, and in different eras as well. So also you get, you know, when people do make talk about it or, or make comments about it, there's a lot of different things at play. You know, everyone has different standards, everyone has different stats that they bring up to try and you know to to, to get their point across. So it's 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 the same, I think, for everyone. Um, and also the fact you know in in sri lanka we we don't play you know in my entire career i played what six or eight test matches in in australia um and so we don't play maybe the big guns as often or in such high profile series as as, as often um i don't know but it's it's it 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 happens you know and that's the way it is usually for me and um and you know, at the end of the day, you know, you can have stats and you can compare stats and, and try and make a case for or against someone or a career. Um, and then, well, that, that's okay. That's that's usually the case it's always been. Mm, yeah, I guess such is life. Tell me about your hunger for runs and kind of where it was uh, built, where it was, where it started. Why? And, and when I say hunger for runs, you, you didn't just score a hundred, you'd score double hundreds and triple hundreds. And people like to score runs, batsmen get runs, but it's not so simple for guys to go, you know, just you know, so much further than the line. Yeah, well, you know, when I first got into the, into the national side, it was not just about runs, it's about trying to cement my place in the side and try and get some confidence uh, behind me, some runs behind me, so I can have, you know, that get through that initial one-year phase where you're, you know, quite vulnerable, especially from our part of the world where there's a lot of turnover in terms of young players coming and, and going out of the side. Um, so I think you know, in my first class career, I'm not sure whether I had a first class hundred before I got a test hundred. I think my first, you know, hundred in, 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 in cricket of any value was my, my first test hundred. Um, and I, I batted at number three and I scored my hundred batting with Murali, who was the last man in. Um, and that really, uh, you know, enhanced my confidence. But before that, uh, in South Africa, my sixth test match, my first series away from home at Centurion. I got 90 and I had opened in the second innings and I batted through the innings, was last man out. And that kind of helped me to understand, okay, you know, it's not easy to score runs. So when you do get some runs, you try and, 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 and maximize it. Um, and then when I started getting runs, I remember my first double hundred was against Pakistan uh, in Lahore, final of the test cha Asian Test Championship. Um, and we had bundled Pakistan out for 260. I had I was keeping wicket at the time. I had just come in and taken my gloves off when openers walked out. And the first ball, Waka Yunis ball, Mao and Adapath was out hooking to find legs. So I had to just get my stuff out and run run out. And I remember getting through Waka's first over. Then Shoib was bowling from the other end. And then suddenly, you know, just batting and not really thinking about it. And then, and then suddenly I remember getting to 100 the next day. And again, just batting, and suddenly I got to 200. Um, um, and I remember walking up to, I think it was Mahal on the other end, and saying, I said, I, I think that's a double 100. I said, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, And then, uh, and, and the funny thing for me was, we also had a dressing room for me where everyone was quite competitive, not just against the opposition, but also within the group. So we were always egging everyone on to get more runs. Get Who's, who's going to get get to 10,000 runs first, who's going to get 20 test hundreds or 30 test hundreds. You know, so we're always pushing each other on and it was a matter of pride to kind of always be in the reckoning with runs and big runs. And also to try and get as many big runs away from home as possible, not just in Sri Lanka. Um, so I think for me, I love batting. Um, and I 
the method I discovered with my batting of converting, you know, hundreds into big hundreds um, really worked for me. I, I found it, you know, first hundred you get there and then you just kind of rinse and repeat a few of the, 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 the sections in, the, in that first hundred without looking much at the scoreboard or without putting too much pressure on yourself. And suddenly you look up, you're 140. Suddenly, half an hour later, you're 160. Um, you know, and, and then you get to a stage where you decide, okay, I'll accelerate a little bit here, take a few risks here, get to that 190, 195, and then knock it around. So, you know, that kind of method, once you discover it, it's quite easy. I won't say it's quite easy, but it's, it then becomes part of your game. It's part of your mental um, uh, skill set as well. And you kind of really are able to conserve your mental energy uh, and work through those difficult periods to convert the hundreds into big ones. I, do you think you would be able to pass that on to the next person? Is that something that can be done? Did someone pass that on to you as well, maybe within uh, that change? Uh, I, I think it was something we always spoke about, but I always think that passing that on can't be in the same form of how it works for me. It has to be uh, you know, kind of applicable to the person I'm passing that on to. So it's, it, I mean, we can have a conversation and I can guide someone to that towards that realization and towards that method. But he's got to fine tune it so it, fine -tune it, so it works for him. And that's the real key. I always believe in, in talking batting or coaching batting. It's not to make others a replica of yourself, but to try and find the best method that makes what they have better and more effective and stronger. Uh, so it's also about knowing the person you're working with, uh, knowing how they are as a person, how they react to negatively or positively to to where information is given and whether they can actually go and put it into practice you know some work better with very little info some work better with a lot more but the most important information they need to have is about themselves what is their game how do they think how do they approach certain situations do they revel under pressure or not you know, how do you create situations that suit these people in our training and in game so you kind of they've got to take ownership of that of, of that final decision, you can you can take them on that journey though. Mm. Did you always score quickly? If, if you think of if you think through the way you played the game right from the beginning, I mean you, you were quite a quick scorer. I mean, fastest to seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand, twelve thousand in test matches, um, and this is across history. So, is that something that was an effort or a particular intention? to ensure that you're getting your runs quickly as well? Um, one of the things we always spoke about in the dressing room was trying to score runs in a manner that created a winning situation. So sometimes it, it meant about absorbing time, but a lot of the time, especially when you batted first, you had to, you had to keep a tempo going through your innings that it didn't really let the, the match drag on or the innings drag on for too long. So scoring runs at different periods with different intensity is really important, not just in a match perspective, but even in from a personal point of view, to kind of have that, that energy store, not, not get depleted by just trying to, you know, just grind, uh, you know, your day out. There are times when it's called for. Um, so I would yeah. pick certain times of the innings to accelerate. If a part-time bowler comes on to give the best bowlers a rest, I might take a risk. You know, sometimes I've, I've got out doing that, but it's a worthwhile risk to try and score 20, 25 quick runs. So you get through a, you know, you create a kind of a, a situation where it puts pressure on the opposition to bring, you know, their better bowlers back who might not be as potent or effective at that stage. Um, mm. And that kind of acceleration, deceleration, uh, when you play and the longer you play, you understand how to do that in a match situation. So it maximizes your run scoring and that in turn helps your side get into better positions. Um, mm -hmm. In one day cricket, it was, it was quite strange. I was batting number... Well, I started at... Uh, I batted from number one to number nine in one day cricket in my career, but I batted mostly at the end of my, at the back end at number three and number four. Uh, but when I first started playing cricket, before when it was just a 15 over field restriction with two catchers, when I went in, the instructions were very simple. You bat till the 45th over, let everyone else bat around you. So it was never a case of trying to do too much or score too quickly, just kind of be the anchor, the linchpin around which everyone else kind of then you know, does their thing. Um, mm. And we all, I remember it was funny, you know, in those days, if the run rate went above six, you think, oh my God, that's such a high run rate. <laughs> How are you going to chase this down? Uh, and then I remember in 2000, you know, 12, 
the 10, 12, 11, 12, 13, we used to talk about, oh, keep the rate under 10 and you'll be fine, you know, and then <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's amazing how that mindset changed. Um, so I was, I was actually quite slow in one day cricket for a long time until the rules changed and my role in the side changed with it as not being a, a guy who just holds up on one side, but actually goes and tries to, you know, finish at least with a hundred percent strike rate. Um, so I played in, in, in every era. So you kind of adjust for me according to, you know, the stage of your career, your, your role in the side um, and, and how your innings progressing. Tell me about your friendship with Mahela. Um, first of all, why did you score so many runs together? Yeah. When you batted together, teams would be like, oh dear, it is a problem. You know, um, why? How come? I think we, we both knew our games quite well. I mean, we knew each other's games quite well. So, like I said, in a, in a match situation, you'll have times when, when you know, Mahela is you know, scoring runs really, really freely and I'd be taking a back seat nudging it around, giving him as much strike as possible, then, you know, we kind of uh, switch in terms of who takes the lead. Um, also, we used to, when we batted, it was a lot about reversing pressure, uh, reversing, reversing pressure on the opposition, uh, getting them into a tight spot and, and talking a lot about why we were batting, what, how, we, how can we do that? Which ball shall we attack? Which ball are you comfortable taking on and who I was comfortable taking on? And then, you know, trying to trying to understand uh, how to do that. So um, I think that and also the fact that we got on really well with each other as friends, you know, we had similar interests. We spent a lot of time, you know, going for meals, talking cricket, you know, talking life. Um, so it was it was kind of a, 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 a really good matchup psychologically and uh, and uh, on the field. So um, that that really helped. And I've scored a lot of runs batting with Dilshan as well. It was a very different dynamic and it's not a case of uh, you know, kind of taking the lead or stepping back. Dilshan, it's just hell for leather. You just, you just go and you let him go, you know, and you, you kind of stay, you know, below the radar and you, you let him you know, do all the, all the bashing work for you. Um, so, yeah, so it just, it's, it's really worked for Mahila and, and myself in that manner. Oh, yeah, well, tell you what, as I said, many teams would be like, oh dear, here, here we go. Here's Sangha and, and my hair yeah. once again. Is your friend, is your, did your friendship begin at cricket? Did it begin at yeah. your, your similar age? So school, different schools? Yeah, no, we went to different sides. schools. We, we went to different schools. I played against him when I was about 16 and under 17 level. But the point was like him, Avishka Gunavardhana, Tilan Samaravira, who are all kind of contemporaries of mine. They were all earmarked for international cricket by the time they were 17. So Mahila, you know, played a lot of national age group cricket, like Sri Lanka under 19 or Sri Lanka A at a very, very young age. Um, and then, of course, when I got into the national side, I think Mahila was already vice captain. Mm. And... Uh, and uh, he's already been vice captain. Then Marvin became vice captain, and then Mahila became vice captain uh, again. So it was uh, he had already played two and a half years of international cricket and a World Cup by the time I joined the team. But he was surrounded by a lot of senior players, like older players. So I mean, we we got off well straight from the start. He also needed company in terms of someone who was a contemporary. We had similar interests. Um, so we, we, we started, you know, really talking, hanging out together. And that is how our friendship grew. And not just on the cricket field, but now after, after retirement, a lot of the, the, the ventures that we have or whatever we, we do, we try and do that together as well. Yeah, OK. I guess, I guess it helped. I mean, it, it obviously did in, in terms of, of getting your guys' runs. Let's talk about captaincy uh, because... You're quoted, I think, as saying something to the effect that um, it's very difficult to last in the captaincy of Sri Lanka. It's a job that will give you gray hairs or a job that will make you age quickly. I can't remember when you said that, but, but you did say that at, at some point. Oh, no. My gray hair. <laughs> well, you didn't do it for that long. I suppose that, oh. that tells you. Yeah, just so true. But it's 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 true. I think you find a lot of the captains. You know, they do very short stints, and 
you get a lot of other stress. It's a wonderful country to captain. I mean, amazing. Such a great privilege and honor to captain, captain your own country and especially Sri Lanka with such a passion for the game. But at the same time, you know, the pressures are not just from within your, your, your team in terms of trying to get the best people in and, and formulating strategy and, and getting them motivated and inspired to go out and do their work. It's also about a lot of the external pressures that come, you know, the, the contract issues and at various times, various things that keep cropping up. Uh, so you've got to be as a captain and as a leadership group, the buffer between the, the side and, and all of that so that people don't lose focus and they don't, uh, we don't have these kind of power struggles or ego trips that, you know, that is natural in, in, in any environment, I think, or a highly charged, highly competitive environment. And to always have that professional relationship between the administration and the team. Um, and it takes its toll um, on, on players, whether it's Mahela, me, or anyone else. It's, it's always been the case. Um, and the most important thing, when you do leave, you don't leave, you know, bitter by the fact that, um, you know, you, 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 you're not happy with what's been... You know, it, 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 if, if it sours your attitude to the game, and it sours the way you play, that, is, that never should be the case. So you should, you know, take the job, do it, take it very seriously and do it with a lot of pride to the best of your ability. But when it starts getting to that time where you think, okay, this is going to affect my game negatively, affect my relationship with the team negatively, uh, and your other relationships maybe at home, wherever, you say, okay, thank you very much. It's time for me to just get back to just playing and, you know, enjoying, uh, enjoying the game that way. And also, you know, once you, once you become a leader, you don't have to be nominated as a captain, right? You can lead your group um, no matter what, no matter, you know, from the, from the dressing room, the quiet word. Um, so it's, yeah. So that, that's, yeah, it is, a, it is a tough job, but I loved it. I enjoyed it. And it's the right time for me to step down when I did as well. Captaincy, um, keeping and scoring runs, all in the melting pot. Tell me about preferences. You've just told me about the difficulties of, of, of captaincy and you know the toughness of the job, but separating and making sure that you can compartmentalize it and still do the great job, which is number one job, score runs. Um, yeah, so I always approach it from the fact that when you back a captain, and this, the whole thing about playing a captain's knock, all of this, it's, 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 it's nice. <laughs> because any innings that you play, if you play it well, is, is, a, is, a, is in a leadership role, whether, it's, whether you're the junior most player or the senior most player or the captain. When you bat, you bat and you do the best that you can. Um, and if you're good enough, you'll be consistent, scoring enough runs not just to hold your place in the side, but also have a really lasting impact on the side's results. Um, mm. you try to put the captaincy hat also when you're batting. It just, it's, it's just way too much pressure to put on yourself. You always keep beating yourself up, maybe second-guessing yourself. So it's really good to leave that captaincy hat on when you're marking your troops in the field or you're having your team meetings, or you're formulating strategy with the rest of the team. And you're, you're, you're trying to provide leadership and inspiration for guys to, you know, buy into, into new, new things, to challenge themselves, to get better, to improve, uh, so on and so forth. So I've always been really, I've, I've managed to do that quite well and not have one impact the other negatively. Uh, and everyone does it differently. But I think the word you used uh, for me, compartmentalize, it's, it's very, very important. Um, bat as a batsman or, or if you're a, a, bowl, a, a, cap, a captain who's a bowler. Bowl as, a, as, as the best possible bowler, bowling version of yourself. Uh, because if it is, you always anyway think like a leader when you're bowling, right? Or when you're batting yeah. and you're constructing innings, you think of the situation of the game, you read the, the, the run of play, you try to anticipate. You know, it's, it's the same thing. We don't need to put that extra pressure of having that nominated captaincy hat on as well. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that really worked for me. Mm. Choose an innings. If, there's so many to choose from. And uh, a few of your fans here saying, hi, Sangha, uncle. So Sri Lanka. So right, Sri Lanka. Uh, everyone's an uncle or an aunt. And yeah. I, I, I'll, be, I'll be 43. I'll be 43. Oh, I, I've met, hey, which, I, you, you hold yeah. it well. Uh, I've, met, I've, met, <laughs> I've met a couple of 
you know guys up and 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 people in that in the twenties who said I grew up watching you and I'm like, huh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Comes to us all, buddy. It comes to us all. Don't worry. Yeah. Come on, choose choose an inning. Um, I would like a test match. I'm going test match. I, I, I think one? I think my uh, my my sixth test match, the one against South Africa Centurion, when I scored 98. I think that was the first time I actually believed myself that maybe I could cut it at international test level. Wow. Until that time, you know, I had a half century in the first test of the match of the series. Um, and then that that 98 really helped me. And I was facing Pollock, Cullis, um, Intini, and a few others. Um, and it's a real test, uh, tough side, the South Africans, in their own conditions. And it's kind of like, okay, I, I, if I can deal with this pressure and score the runs, yeah, I can, I can maybe step, go up a step further. So that was really important for me. That's, a, that's amazing. I, again, I'll say... You speak to guys and you think they'll go somewhere, but they don't. And, and it means so many things. And it, there's so many different meanings with many things that go on in a guy's career. But as you say, you know, 98, and you spoke about it before as well. You said, you know, you've got a couple of 90s before you got 100. So yeah. it, it said to you, other than I can mix it with the guys, it also said, Hey, look, when you get here, you got to make sure you get past and keep going for as long as possible because yeah. you're not going to you know, get too many chances. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the, the most important thing about scoring runs from a personal point of view is it allows the ability to, to fiddle with your game and invest in taking a few risks. So my theory on batting was that you could never bat the same way throughout your mm. career. You have to change. And I have changed some of the fundamental mm. things about my game from my grip to my stance to my back lift to my trigger movement, everything, my head position, all of that I've changed over the years to try and try and get a little bit better, to try and counter a specific strategy. Um, it could be a, a variety of things. Um, so it was really important that I had the volume of runs behind me because sometimes when you change something, if you have a good enough time to practice, that's great. Maybe a couple of practice games to see whether it works, fantastic. Other times, you've got to make changes on the go. So you might have a couple of failures before everything kicks in and, and starts working properly. So it helps, isn't it, Bob? When you have the wickets mm -hmm. or the runs behind you, you can make a few mistakes that maybe someone else can't. You might have a slightly you know, longer grace period. Um, so mm -hmm. that was really important. And in, in, when I look back, there were really periods of time when I did made major changes. And I had to wait a little while for them to work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it was really th those runs that I had got just before that was, was felt, you know, it held me in good stead. Yeah, Junaid here says, what's your favorite stadium? Oh, I love goal. Play, yeah. That's where I made my, my debut. I actually, I started when I was at, at school in Candy at Trinity College. I played school mm. cricket on the international test ground because that was owned by my school. So I scored a school 100. And I've scored a test 100 at that same ground. It's a beautiful ground. I absolutely love it. But unfortunately, Palle Calais now in Candy has replaced it yeah. Um, yeah. as the international ground. Um, for uh, uh, Then, of course, if you take England, Lords and Surrey, I've had very special memories of, of both, the Oval and, 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 and Lords. Um, the Bullring in, in South Africa, I absolutely love. Uh, and the stadium in Bulawayo when it's Zimbabwe. Um, mm. You know, some, some, some great stadiums around the world. Adelaide in Australia, especially the, the new version of it. How beautiful is that, you know? Yeah. Um, I've yeah. never played a test match at Sydney. Um, so there are various grounds, but Gaul is always going to be the sentimental favorite. Uh, it's a beautiful setting, the, the, the Dutch fort at the back, sea on either side. Um, a very special, very special place. Yeah. Um, Hayata here says, I hope I've got that right in terms of um, pronunciation. He said, who is the future of Sri Lanka batting? <laughs> That's a tough question. Oh, there are so many, so many people uh, that you can, you can count on. To me, I think, you know, he's received a lot of criticism over this short period of time he's been in the side, you know. But Kusal Mendes, to me, every time I watch him bat, I believe yeah. that... Yeah handled correctly um, and, and given a, a slightly stronger grounding in terms of how to think 
about his game and situations in a match. I think he's he's the most special player out of the current lot who can go really really far. Angelo Matthews, I reckon by this time he should have scored ten thousand runs easily in every format in in both the one days and the and the and the test formats. He again when I when he first came into the side was such a special player and he still is. He's still by far the best batsman Sri Lanka has. Uh, but I think and he needs to get a lot more consistent in converting. You know these runs into big runs and to bat in a pivotal position of number four or five. Uh, but out of the mm-hmm. younger lot, definitely Kusal Mendes. I mean, Avishka Fernando. There are so many others. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll settle on Kusal Mendes. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Hassan, who says, "How is Sri Lanka domestic cricket?" And I'll throw something onto that as well and say, domestic cricket slash school cricket why does that work it seems different to everywhere else in terms of a setup yeah we our, we our school cricket is extremely strong i mean we have some wonderful cricketers of course we can take it far uh, much much further in terms of getting the getting cricket into all the schools especially in the north and the east where we have some tremendous talent that i saw from 2011 Uh, sorry, yeah, two thousand eleven when we first ran a tournament there called the Murley Harmony Cup through our foundation, um, and for six to six and a half years we ran it. It is amazing to see that kind of raw, unpolished talent. So we need to take, you know, facilities uh, and infrastructure there to the North Indies to have these kids come into the mainstream. Um, but schools cricket is a bedrock on which Sri Lankan cricket is built. The national side has seen so many wonderful cricketers. Come through this system, mm. and earlier it was most of the elite schools in Colombo, but since the the the, the early nineties, late eighties, that's that 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 power um, uh, has, has has shifted to the outstations, um, and we get a lot of cricketers now coming in from the outstations. The issue is first class cricket for me, where we have twenty mm. four clubs playing first class cricket, so your talent is spread extremely thin. The quality of competition is 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 not good enough, um, so we really need to streamline that because you can have a really strong international side and a really strong school side, but the real pl- area where you learn your cricket in terms of crafting out international standard runs, international standard victories and wickets, that's the first class system. So we need to bring it down to that five sixteen provincial um, um, set up really. Have the best of the players playing against you know the best, uh, so that you don't have to to teach cricketers how to play first class cricket by the time they join the international side. Yeah, yeah, tough. Yes, and, and, and it's tough to get sides. Um, yeah, and or... also, and also imagine as a national selector, mm. selecting a final fifteen from four hundred plus players. Get yeah, it down tough. to get it down to get it down to you know. Five to six sides, you know, and you have a squad of fifteen each. If you have six provinces, you have ninety players to choose from, and that's such a, a an easier job. And you can make assessments of quality of run making and wicket taking and bowling and fielding because you are testing yourself against the best that's on offer. And selectors will find it much easier to watch those games personally as well. So um, that part is always what's been lacking in Sri Lankan cricket. And if you mm. don't have that kind of Extraordinary talent coming through year after year. You don't have kind of cricketers who come through with who are talented, but then suddenly you you give them that that grounding, that extra work at first class level, and suddenly you find a player you might not have looked twice at five years ago, suddenly becoming one of the best players in the side. You know that learning environment. We need to really strengthen it. Okay. Um, World Cups. Um, One, how inspired you were by um, your side winning guys older than you who came before you, Arjuna and Aravinda, and and all of them. What it did for you, what it did to you. Number two, there were a few um, <clears throat> runners up medals uh, before, <laughs> yeah. before finally. <laughs> And I know it's different game, but before finally, sort of 2014. Whoa, oh, right, got it. Tell yeah. me about that as well. Well, um, yeah, the runners-up uh, medals. Uh, yeah, they were 
they were not very pleasant memories. I mean, it was fantastic <laughs> finals, but to actually play that and 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 fall at the at the last hurdle was was quite heartbreaking, um, and it was. Uh, it was not easy to take it, but then in 2014, when we got the opportunity, yes. it was again going to be maybe, you know, my last opportunity to try and win a uh, a um, a World Cup final. So uh, to, to get over that was really, really satisfying because you know we always measure everything that we do against what we saw in uh, in 1996. Sorry, I'm walking around, Tommy. I'm just getting no, ready. no, no, no problem. <laughs> Um, it's called so, a mobile uh, phone. <laughs> and, uh, so it was, uh, um, it was kind of, uh, we were inspired to try and match that. Right. You know, to try and win and have a, have a victory for ourselves so that we could have, you know, bring that kind of inspiration back to the country and the younger players as well. So uh, unfortunately, we missed out so many, many times and, I think the good thing for us was that in 2014, even when we knew that it could be one of our last opportunities, we never got too desperate because if we had, we might have made so many mistakes that wouldn't have been great in terms of sealing a win. But we were quite mm -hmm. clinical. We were quite unemotional when we played mm -hmm. that final. Uh, and we just went about our processes. We did so many things right. Um, and we walked away with a win. So that was really, really satisfying. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to shift you away from the game. Do you still sing? Do you play the violin still? No, I played till I was 16. It was like torture for me. My father insisted <laughs> that I had singing lessons and, and violin lessons. And now I'm, I'm, I projected that onto my children. And so they're playing piano, they're singing, they're playing guitar. Uh, and, and a lot of, they complain a lot while they do that. But uh, I, think it, I think it's so important. Uh, there's my daughter right there. She's, uh, uh, um, and I think it's really important if you can to have the opportunity to learn how to play an instrument or to sing. Um, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. All right. Okay. Well, I thought you might still, do you, do you regret stopping or, you know, would you feel like picking up a, a, a violin or playing an instrument every now and again? Uh, I wish I could. No, I don't. I, I think I've lost it. It's something that you need to keep training at and you need to keep in touch with. Um, I, so I, I try and insist on my kids practicing at the right time and they have their lessons. So um, it's good when that happens. But uh, it's not easy, right? It's, it's a tough thing, no. especially when you're, a, when you're a very, very young child to try and get you motivated, you know, to, to practice an instrument. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, hope they'll, I, I hope they'll keep at it. Yeah, and you hope they'll thank you for it at the end of it as well. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah I, I, I'm not expecting that much from it. <laughs> if, they if they just try and, you know, do that, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, Ministry of Crab, MCC president, first non-Brit, by the way, since 1787. Um yeah. You're also an ambassador, um, high commissioner to the UK. I'm trying no, to understand. No, I wasn't high commissioner to the UK. I was offered. No, for... offered, 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 offered. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of Kumar away from the game of cricket. Kumar's passions other than, other than cricket. Who is he away from the game? No. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not very, how would you say, I'm, I'm quite boring away from, away from the game. I've spent the last three months trying to help my kids with their distance learning platform, which is online. All the schools have gone online. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I, I don't do a huge amount. I have a, a few of the foundations and charities that have been very close to my heart, especially three of them. Um, over the last few years. One is the foundation of goodness. I've been a part of it for almost 20 years now, um, mm -hmm. along with Mahela and Murali and a few other committed uh, trustees. Uh, then the Ayati Trust in Sri Lanka, where you know my wife was inspired to try and kick off a project uh, you know, to, uh, to build Sri Lanka's first center of excellence for children with disabilities. And we had some wonderful corporates 
uh, and a former international cricketer, Roshan Mahanama, and so many other donors and, and well-wishers who joined in. Um, and we managed to open that after, you know, close to four years of really hard work on the 25th of January. Um, we run a, uh, uh, I'm part of a, I'm a trustee of a foundation that runs a 24-7 anti-suicide hotline. And we have uh, awareness programs and, 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 and workshops on, on mental health. Um, so it's, uh, I've been very lucky to be a lot, part of, of, of a lot of that. But apart from that, I, mean, I spend a lot of time at home. I have a few other you know, businesses like those restaurants that I keep an eye on and try to run, uh, uh, not run myself because we've got some really good people who do it for us. Uh, but to try and stay involved in, 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 in things like that, that really give me a lot of, lot of joy and satisfaction. But now it's mostly about the kids, you know, trying to get them you know, to do their work, make sure that they... They, uh, they study well and they work hard uh, and, have, and, and, and spend some time, you know, uh, um, you know, with them. So yeah. I think it's really good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, an, it's the non-cricket side that I'm particularly interested in. Yeah. Question on the MCC presidency um, and the job, the difficulty, the joy um, when, when you were asked to, to succeed and, and kind of why you took it. Sorry, Pami, just one second for one second. You're going to click onto your, onto, your, onto your car. Duplication road. Yeah, I've got to connect this to my car. All right, go I ahead. Know, but I have enough battery to last me a while. So why I took the, the MCC? So I was actually surprised when I got the call. And Anthony Rayford, who was the, the, the former president, he was in Sri Lanka just before or for the the tour by England when Rangana Hera retired and I mm. had dinner with him one night and we were having a chat. Mahila was also there. My wife was there. And um, a couple of months later, I get a text from Anthony saying, I've got something to ask you, um, um, but it's very confidential. So I said, yes, of course. I thought, what, what have I done now <laughs> to, to anger the president <laughs> of the NPC? Um, so I sat down and I had a chat. And uh, I thought so I called him and then he said, you know, I've started to ask you, you can't tell anyone, maybe just your wife, uh, because I just wanted to see whether you'd be interested in becoming the next president of the MCC. So I was like, I'm serious, this is a, you know, it's, it's a great honor, but, <laughs> but, you know, why me? And then he said, no, no. And he, you know, we had this little conversation. I said, I said, Anthony, I can't just say yes to you straight away. I need to understand what the job means. I need to understand whether I could actually commit to doing a proper job at it so I will need some time so it took about another two weeks of having a conversation with my family and with Anthony and with Guy Lavender who was the, the who is who still is a CEO uh, um, of the club to understand what the role and only then did I actually say okay I, I, I actually can commit to it and uh, um, and hopefully do a proper job that I said yes so um, it was not instantaneous, but I'm very, very privileged and, and honored to be there. Hmm. How's it been? Um, it's been very good. Well, tough year now with COVID for everyone, including MCC and Lords. You know, our, our ground redevelopment with the Compton and Edridge stands, uh, you know, host of matches that were to be played, uh, hosting and, 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 and F and B and and corporate hospitality, you know, all of that, you know, to be deferred to later on in the year. Hopefully, now with the with England opening up again, slowly but surely, you know, it, it, it's it's not been an easy year. But the club chairman and the and the chief exec and everyone, the, all the committees and the and the teams um, have been doing a, an amazing job making sure the club is ready for a post COVID environment the club is well prepared and most of the contingencies have been planned for and the club is in control of of of, uh, of that of that process uh, it's been really good to see uh, and the membership has been informed of a lot of what's been going on because ultimately you know the responsibility is towards you know the membership um, mm. and and, uh, and of course then onwards to the game at large um, and I think I've been very, very impressed at, at, at how everyone at MCC and at Lords uh, have the, how they've handled this very, very tricky and trying 
um, uh, circumstance. Mm. Yeah, a new normal awaits, I think, for absolutely everybody. And it's a, a case of trying to resurrect things for, for many, absolutely. if not if not absolutely everybody. Yeah. Right. We're, we're going to end.